um, really, this is the first time we're meeting, so yes. my people are going to meet you all at the same time that I'm meeting you, which I think calls for a really genuine conversation, so I'm excited. Give the people a yeah. little intro to who you are and what you do. Awesome, awesome. Well, it is very nice to meet you as well. Uh, thank you. We've talked on the phone, I know. You reached out, and um, I'm just, I'm really excited that you're getting into the business, so congrats on that. Thank you. And, uh, my name is John Spaschak. I'm better known as the market dominator in the real estate business. Been in the business for um, uh, about a, de a decade and a half, and w I just love it. I have a lot of passion for it. Our, our whole tagline with the team that um, I run is educate, advocate, negotiate, and dominate. And so we love taking care of our clients. We have a lot of passion with what we do. Most of it is, is really teaching because we try to empower our clients to make decisions on their own behalf. And the better prepared they are, the more knowledge they have, the more successful their decisions are. Wow. Wow. You have that spiel down packed. I love that. Like, so, so I was first introduced to you actually at my like church, small group, like whatever, but like, and someone was like, Oh, like if you need a realtor, like I know an all Christian team. And I was like, Oh, there's like an all Christian team out there. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, tell me more. And at the time, like, I think I had maybe just signed up for my license, like coursework, all that stuff, but I wasn't like anywhere in the business. And you know, like, I'm in this phase in my life where I'm like, okay, I need a, a job and a career that, like, honors God, and I don't know what that means for me, and I'm just like, okay, like, I always thought I was going to do real estate in my 30s, um, and then, like, I had very coincidentally, godly, like, met this couple, and they were like, why aren't you doing real estate now, and I'm like, you're kind of right. And so I went to class and I still was like, okay, God, I don't really understand. And so I went to Tom Cusack. I don't know if you went to him, but oh, yeah. the man, the myth, the, myth, the legend, um, amazing. But, and he was said that like this purchase, like real estate is like some, most people's largest purchase, purchase that they will make in their life. And they need someone that's going to advocate for them or educate them in their purchase. And I was like, oh, Okay, I like it. it You're clicked. Even in my tagline, I love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's real. Well, as soon as you said that, I'm like, oh yes, like literally, like you could say it better than me, but that is exactly um, what I think all agents should be doing. But what were you doing before real estate? Like only oh, ten that's years. That's a good like, question. You had life before this. Yeah. So you know, we well, currently we 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 operate our team as a ministry. Wow. Okay. Um, and. We don't apologizing for loving Jesus, although we do not jam Jesus down people's throats. That is not a good approach. Um, so I, I originally went to school and got a Bible and a psychology degree. Okay. And um, but where'd, where'd you go to school? I went to school at Nyack College, oh. uh, where which is, is that? a Christian. Uh, it's a a Christian liberal arts college down near New York City, about eighteen miles north of the city on the Hudson River, right on the Tappan Zee Bridge. Um, beautiful little school we went uh, went to and um, really had a great experience there, but um, ended up staying there after school and working there and getting in, into athletics. I'm a former college basketball player. I played at Nyack and uh, ended up going into coaching. And eventually coaching led me here to Buffalo, New York, where I coached at Canisius College um, for four years from 2000 to 2004. And so it took me a little bit to, to find my landing into real estate. But uh, when I did, boy, could I tell you that this was a perfect match for me, for my skill set, for my passion, uh, my, my love for teaching and coaching. And um, it's just been, you know, a blessing ever since. So for you, you're like literally coaching your clients through their home buying process. The whole approach I take. Because like most people are like, yeah, I have no idea like what. Like I look at myself like I was um, in the market. I was thinking about buying a house like a couple of years ago. And I'm like, you just like, when, especially when you're so young, but if you've never bought a house before, like just the, the task of thinking about selling a, or buying a home is like, you don't even know where to begin. Um, coaching, though, like, so for, I, I think it's interesting, and we didn't really talk a lot about God, like, when we were, like, texting, but, like, I think this is, like, the purpose of the interview a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. did you, like, grow up in, like, a Christian home? Like, what, like, what is your testimony? Like, where did you find oh, God man. in your life? Boy, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> no, I did not grow up. I grew up in a Catholic home, uh, but a non-committed Catholic home. Okay, so amen, we to well, we, amen to that. Well, not You know, we... <laughs> We went in uh, Christmas and Easter, if that. Um, but 
my uncle, my mother's brother, at 32 years old, he was a cool Harley riding guy. Mm. And uh, we all looked up to him. And then um, when I was young, probably about six years old, he got into a really bad uh, motorcycle accident. Mm. And he was, he was dead on arrival. Um, oh, wow. And they called it in, but the dispatch at the hospital uh, knew who he was and pleaded with the emergency crew on site to give him uh, a tracheotomy on site. Now, back then, they didn't do that too often. That's like when they like put like an airway in your yeah, neck kind of thing. Yeah, they'll cut you right through your throat Ugh. and put an airway right into your into your throat down into your chest. So uh, they they saved him that way, but the doctor said he'd be a vegetable for the rest of his life, and uh, he was in a coma for six weeks, and uh, all of a sudden he woke up. Wow! And about ten days later, he was up out of his bed walking around. Eventually. Sad story is that uh, while he was in the hospital, his wife, who had three kids and was pregnant with their fourth, decided to divorce him and leave him. Oh, my god! So it gosh. wasn't a good situation. So when he got out finally, um, and now this was, he was in the hospital for probably a good year and a half, um, we took him in. Mm -hmm. And I actually shared a bedroom with him. And one day he woke up and said, I need somebody to take me to church. And my older sister, uh, who had a car, took him to church. And uh, he came home preaching the gospel to me. And uh, several weeks later, dragged me to church, uh, where I heard the gospel. And he began, because of his, his accident, had a unique brain injury that gave him incredible amounts of uh, uh, ability to memorize. Although he lost a lot of his long-term memory, his short-term memory going forward was amazing. It was kind of savant-like. So he literally memorized the entire Gospel of John and would preach it to me wow. and recite it. And, uh, and that's how I came to know the Lord. And, you know, you, you talk about miracle story. That's a miracle story. So, uh. you know, I lost my way through the years uh, back and forth uh, to Jesus before he, you know, really got a hold of me and... Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, he lives in me and through me uh, on a daily basis. And I'm extremely, extremely blessed to live an abundant life. Oh, oh I love that. That is so powerful. Yeah. And like, even like, even like when we walked in here, there was like, I should whisper, but there was nobody <laughs> in here. And I didn't think anyone was coming. And then people showed up. I'm like, you never know who needs to hear the word, even That's if right. it's just in the background. Um, but that is super powerful, and I think a lot of people can identify, like, at least I grew up in South Buffalo, like, the Irish Catholic home, like, mm -hmm. same thing, like, maybe sometimes we went to church on Easter and Christmas, like, probably not, but, like, maybe, um, I went, oh, oh, you know what, you say Jesus is always there, and he was always there for me, like, one of my favorite songs, and it was so true, like, I see sprinkles of it, but I did, I knew Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus, mm -hmm. and, um, I, the Lord doesn't want me to tell my full testimony yet. I'm actually going to a conference in New York City this weekend. Um, awesome. Yeah, I'm super excited, but I had this most profound, and I look forward to telling you a story one day, most profound experience in Cincinnati when DeMar Hamlin got hurt. Uh -huh. And when I tell you it was like seeing a man resurrected, um, I don't want to say like Jesus Christ, but to have Jesus Christ like move through him, um, there was no denying it for me. I had been listening to Life Church Buffalo, uh, like on YouTube for like a little bit, and then after that, it was like. You so you were at the game. Yeah, so I do tailgating experiences, like um, so game day hospitality. They're nationwide tailgating, mm -hmm. all you can eat and drink, all that, and we run their Buffalo Hub, um, and we're close with the owner John, and they needed people to go down to Cincinnati, and it's funny because it was to um, New Year's Eve, and so me and my girlfriend, who we also she works with it or whatever, we we're gonna go to Toronto, and after, okay, Lauren, like you could come down to Cincinnati, work it, but like you don't have to be there, and I was like, I'm not going. I don't know what it was, you know what I mean? Like it was like it was my flesh being like, I don't want that. I'm like I'm not going. Why would I not want to travel? I'm like I'm not going. I'm driving separately. I hate to drive. I'm driving. I'm going home after. I end up going there, and it it changed my life. God sent me on a mission there. Wow. And, and we ended up, we were only supposed to be there for like two, three days. We ended up staying for five days because me and my friend were both entrepreneurs. We really didn't have to go home. And when we came home, it, it felt like the end of the movie. Like it finally was like, okay, like he woke up. We found Jesus. I found this man with a 10-foot cross. Everyone prayed. It was just insane. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. But like it, it really was like there was no denying that, that like Jesus had touched my life. And like in 
um, divine timing. Like I grew up in a very like, I don't want to call it ugly, but like double alcoholic household, mm-hmm. like, you know, both my parents had fractured relationship with religion. And I say religion because even people now are like, oh, Lauren, like, and I'm grateful because I feel like people are comfortable enough to have the conversation with me because I wasn't always like this. It's like, why are you religious? I'm like, I'm not religious. Like, I have a relationship with Jesus. There you go. Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. Um, but I, I think that's cool that you say you live an abundant lifestyle. Like this past mm-hmm. week, I forget what it was, but oh, well, so I'm going to this financial, it's with John Sangle, the mm-hmm. I was broken, now I'm not, that's six right. week small group series. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, write out, you, write out your goals so you know what you want. And it was like, yeah, you might think that like li- wanting to have a beach house when you're older is like so materialistic, but like you never know who's going to need to hear Jesus at the beach house kind of thing. That's right. Um, so when you got into the business, like what was your goal? Did you jump in? full send like full-time job were you still coaching like what was the beginning of your career like yeah so I I was full-time when I when I got in and I was fortunate enough to you know not have to sell a house that month Um, but I also had a lot of sales experience Mm. you know when you're recruiting kids um, across the country to come to college under a scholarship it's very similar to selling somebody a house you're selling to the whole family. And it's a very big decision. It's not, you know, you're not selling somebody a pair of shoes, right? And so uh, that was great experience uh, for, for this role as, uh, in being in real estate. What I needed to do was learn how to do the deal and just know the paperwork. So I had a really, really blessed start in the business and did well right out of the box. Um, I started with Hunt Real Estate, and uh, you know when you go to when you when you know unlike you, you called me and you you didn't really know where you were going to land, and I was kind of sharing some things with you. But most agents they go to school to get their license; they don't think about the different types of real estate brokerages, and they go from the whole gamut from A to Z. So I ended up at more of a corporate brand real estate, Hunt Real Estate, and. Uh, it took me about a year, year and a half to realize I was in the wrong spot for, for me because I, I had the attitude, I'm running my own business. Mm. Uh, I don't work for you. You're getting the privilege of hanging my license with you, and you're going to get paid as a result because New York State establishes that way. So when I realized that, uh, I was giving way too much money of my business that I was generating to a real estate brokerage. And then I moved over to, at the time, the best opportunity was with Keller Williams. And I was there for uh, about 10 years. That's still pretty corporate, too. Like, that's, what is that, like the second or third largest in the nation? Uh, well, K- Keller Williams worldwide is probably the number one real estate company um, oh, wow. worldwide in, in number of transactions, volume, and number of agents. Uh, but they're worldwide. They have franchises all across the world. Um, and they, um, they were the first ones in Buffalo, really, to have a legitimate brokerage that had a cap. Okay. Okay, we talk about this cap. Yeah, right? so, like, for people that have no background in real estate, when you get your license, you get, you know, license, and then you have to go to a broker, basically someone uh, above you to hold your, like, insurance and, like, make sure you're doing your job right. Correct. And then a cap rate would be, like, how much money you're paying them for the entire year. And some companies, you stop at a certain amount, like, because Metro Roberts were assigned, it's 12000 about to be 10000 But did Hunt have a cap? And Keller Williams does, doesn't have a cap, right? Like, you keep paying into them, no, right? No, no, Keller Williams has a cap. They they were the oh, first okay. ones to bring the cap system, and that's why Keller Williams grew across the world. Oh, and they were the first ones, really, in the, in the '90s to start that concept. And Gary Keller, the you know, he's very um, you know brilliant guy, and you know, just kind of changed the real estate industry. And so, no, Hunt does not have a cap. You will always pay into Hunt. You'll always pay into Howard Hanna. You know, the, Howard these Hanna are, doesn't have one either? No, you'll always pay into them. So Whoa. the most forward-thinking, agent-centric instead of broker-centric brokerage that you can find in western New York, without a doubt, and I do my research every year on this, is Metro Roberts Realty. Jim <laughs> Roberts is focused on really creating a life for agents where they can understand generational wealth. 
and teaching them how to do that. And he puts not only his money where his mouth is, he puts his legs where his mouth is. He goes out and he works. He shows up every day. He's got posts for us on social media to follow him. He'll teach you how to buy and sell houses as an investment and flip houses and get into a mortgage foreclosure business. Um, he's willing to, to back. He backs other agents that work for other brokerages that want to start a business. He will back them. Wrap your brain around that. I love that. That's amazing. It is amazing. So here at Metro Roberts, I'm not, you know, I'm biased because I'm at Metro Roberts, mm -hmm. but I was at Keller Williams for 10 years, but he, he came up with a better plan as we have the, the world's greatest real estate technology platform in KV core technology. Um, so the technology platform is the greatest in, in anywhere, you know, Hunt and Howard Hanna and Keller Williams, their systems are archaic compared to KV core. And I've seen them all. Um, we don't pay E and O insurance here. We're the only brokerage, you know, every other brokerage agents pay their own E and O insurance. We wow. don't, we don't pay that here, folks. We pay 12,000 tops into, out of all of our real estate transactions. Once we've contributed 12,000 for the rest of that fiscal year, we pay nothing. Okay. Um, and it's going to go down to 10 starting in 2024. Which is so, so soon. <laughs> yeah, it was very soon. <laughs> right. Because in about another month, any transaction you write is going to be closing in 2024, right? Wow. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's, uh, real estate is not easy, but if you are, uh, have an entrepreneurial type spirit and you're willing to learn, it's like drinking out of a fire hose for the first year or two. Um, <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, you can't drink all the water if you're drinking out of a fire hose. Yeah. Right? It's going to come spitting out of your mouth, and half of it will miss you. It'll blow you over. You'll, you know, yeah. it'll knock you over, right? That's the amount of information that real estate has mm. to become expert in it so you can feel confident to lead someone else through the process of transacting on their house, okay? So we talked about coaching before. Yeah. Could I, could I just dig in here Please a little bit do. on this? Please do. Please so, do. So... This is what we, one of the things we go over with all of our clients. We, we care about the clients. There's an old corny line that says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Ah. Uh, okay? So true. So with that, what are we doing really? Are we selling somebody? You're not going to sell anybody anything in real estate. It's too big of a transaction to sell somebody on it. We use this word all the time, and it's not really correct. We have to serve them through the process so that they can become as expert as possible in a short amount of time you have to teach them to be able to put them in a position to make the best decisions in their behalf. And when you go to real estate school, they're going to teach you a fancy word called fiduciary, mm -hmm. which has six elements to it, right? Old car. Old car. Right? <laughs> And so when you're, when you're representing a client in a fiduciary fashion, you have to look out for their best interest above your own. And so in doing that, what we did is we studied, we broke it down. Do you know in real estate, there is only seven markets. There's seven markets of real estate. That's it. What are they? Like, what do you mean? Like, like. I love it. Commercial. I'm so like, glad you asked. Use, like what? That first one is first time buyers. Okay. First time buyers create their own market. Okay. Next is second-time buyers. Second-time buyers are people who grow their family, usually, okay, and they need a larger home. Now, a second-time buyer could be a divorcee, you know, whatever. You could, you, but, but generally speaking, if you follow the life cycle, you got first-time buyers, you got second-time buyers, they grow their family, they need a bigger house. You got people who can't handle growing the family, they get divorced. <laughs> They're like, okay. <laughs> that creates a market. Yeah. Right? Okay. And you then have people who they handle growing the family and those kids grow up and they go away to college or move on. They get a job, they move out of the house. Those are called empty nesters. They want to downsize. Then you have people who relocate because of a job. You have investors who buy and sell houses and you have people who pass. And then you're like selling their estate? Yes. Oh. So those are the seven reasons. Now we, at my team, we don't deal with investors. Uh, investors will use you and run you in the ground. 
generally speaking. Like r- realtors, they'll use and run you into the ground? Yeah, they'll mean? want you to do all their work. They won't listen to your advice. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. They're just looking for you to help open doors and f- help them find properties that they, they don't really want to pay you on. Mm-hmm. So um, not a good business model for me anyway, we have found, to, to deal with investors. So there's six areas. Now, do you know, if you think about it, if you're a first-time buyer, mm-hmm. If you're a second-time buyer, you're growing your family. You've got a growing family. You need a bigger house. You get divorced. <laughs> you, all of a sudden, your kids move out, and you've got a huge house you're living in, and you've got to downsize. You've lived in that house for maybe 15, 20 years. Um, you relocate because of a job. Or you're dealing with picking up the pieces of someone in your family that died, and now you're an executrix or an executor, and you have to pick up the pieces and move on. And part of that is selling their house. Now, each one of those experiences is somewhat stressful. Yeah. Majority of those are like really sad situations besides like one and two, but even like two, like you probably want to be in your original home, which just doesn't work for you anymore or whatever. But like, yeah. So, and so you're, it's like, you're kind of, do you feel like a therapist sometimes? Like you're like, everyone's like stressed and depressed and you're like, all right, let me, I'm here to figure it out. But like, it's a big test to figure out. It is. We turn depression into excitement. We turn anxiety into enthusiasm. This is what we do. And so we do it in a way by understanding what people are going through during that transition. So we've spent a lot of time trying to get behind people and learn what they're going through. What are their needs? Everybody doesn't have the same needs. People going through that same transition might handle it completely different. So you got to get to know your client. There's a get in the know process with your client early on so that you can know how to best serve them. Because aren't we supposed to serve them? We're supposed to do what, what is in their best interest above our own? That's serving, not selling. Right? What are you doing? What questions are you asking somebody when you're getting to know them for a transaction? Well, if I have no idea what, what I'm walking into, okay, one of the one of the best lines and early in the business i would do this a lot because a lot of times you're walking into a lead that you don't you don't know it's completely cold and i would walk into a house and i'd say hi my name's john i'm so glad to be here can i ask you a question and they'd say sure i'd say why am i here (laughs) and they're probably like who are you (laughs) and you shut up you say why am i here and you shut up they know why you're there i know why i'm there but i want to get to the why behind the why Mm. Right. And usually if you say, why am I here and you shut up and you don't speak again, then you're going to learn so much. It's in one question. You can get as much information as in having to ask 20 separate questions. Okay, And do you know that this will be good for listeners out there? The human dialogue does not allow for more than seven seconds of silence. Oh my gosh. I was just talking about that last night. In the seven seconds, I didn't know that. Wait, but what do you, like, people don't like pauses in conversation or like, what do you mean by that? We're waiting seven seconds. Look at, I already broke it. You broke it already. <laughs> All I had to do was not respond. Should we sit for seven seconds? Look, I'm still y- breaking y- it. Yeah. It's very <laughs> difficult. It's very difficult, people. So when you're really trying to serve someone and you really want the answer to that question, like that's your motive, that's your intent, if it really is, then you're going to shut up. You're not going to respond. You're going to let them respond. It's not yours to answer their question, right? I like that. So it's very powerful if you understand the seven-second rule. And early on, I would say, why am I here? Now, because of the way we serve people, we have a longstanding history of proven success that, believe it or not, 98% of our business comes through personal referral. And we're getting a lot of information walking into it. It's not any longer a cold lead that I'm walking into. It's a very warm, hot lead that I'm walking into. And so I'll already have some information, but I might dig down a little bit more. And And I might, you know, I might ask them, you know, you know, a good question just to get, timeline is huge. You know, if you had your druthers, if it was your wish, when would you see yourself on the other side of this in your new home? Like you're asking seller and buyer this? Or like, what do you mean? If you're dealing with a seller. Okay. 
like how desperate are you to sell it basically kind of thing or what? Desperate might be a scary word to use. I'm not going to put desperate in their mind. Okay, fair. I'm just going to ask the question and they're going to tell me because I'm going to ask the question and I'm going to shut up and they're going to tell me. Now, I don't work with buyers anymore. Scott Catillus, one of the best buyers agents in Western New York, who's my buyers agent on the Market Dominators team, he does it. But I've trained him how to do this, and he does it very well. He does the same thing. So he'll sit at a Tim Hortons, never meet in a real estate office, meet in a Tim Hortons on even ground. It's how Just the world works today. It's more thing. comfy. Okay. Buy them a cup of coffee. Sit down coffee. with them. That's yeah, there that, you go. There's that's the, the jersey southern, in me. yeah. <laughs> that's the jersey in me. So, you know, same question. If, if you had your druthers, if it was your wish, when would you see yourself in your, in your new home? Right? And you let them respond. Um, you're going to learn a lot of information um, when you ask a question and you're just quiet. So that's a very powerful, disciplined thing that took me a lot of years to learn uh, because I like to talk. Oh my gosh, I could talk all day long. Yeah. But actually not all, the, like, you know, like uh, sitting, like you were just like spewing information, like, like in the best way, like just like, like there, there's seasons to it. Like not, se you're seasoned, like you're a veteran to it. So you know what you're talking about. But so you, you're saying I'm old. No, no I, <laughs> he walked in this office and said, I'm old. And I said, no, you know what you're talking about. But like you, I'm sure you've developed the skill of like what, like, I don't know. Do people ever like beat around the bush in a way? Like kind of like. They so don't want to say how bad they need this or, like, what they really need. Or maybe they say they only need a two-bedroom, but, like, you know they're probably going to need more room or less room. Like, what is that like? So your main goal when you're digging down on this is to build trust. Mm. So let me explain that for a second because this is this, – you can't miss this. This is going to be really good for anybody new in the business and maybe even older agents who, who are seasoned don't understand this fully. But – the greatest need on the human planet is not to be loved as it is thought. It's to be known. Wow. Okay? And you will not accept love, which you need from others, if you don't trust that person loves you. So if I walk up to you, Lauren, we've just met, and I say, Lauren, I love you. I love you. You're going to say, oh, that's awesome. That's cool. But you're going to take that as a little bit of a socially warm kind of statement. You're not going to drink that in. It's like, no, this guy loves me, right? I'm going to be like, what's your intention? Like, what yeah. are you trying to do? How do you know if, how can you verify that I love you when you know that I don't really know you? Whoa. Okay. I'm going to be talking about that one for a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. So the best way to build trust, so you're not going to trust me. And there's something that's called third party complimenting. And this proves my point. So if I walk out of here today and in a week later, somebody in the business says, oh, my God, I, you, were, you do a podcast? You were on the podcast with the market dominator? He told me how awesome you are, and he just loves you. If you heard that from them, you would believe it more from them than you would from me telling you right now. So true. Yeah. That's called third-party complimenting is because you can trust it. But you can't trust it if it comes directly from me until you can verify that I know you. Ah, me trying to wait the seven seconds, but it's like 2.5 seconds. Yeah. But no, literally, yeah. So Metro Roberts Facebook group or whatever just got added into it. Someone needed like a fence contractor. And I have a fence co contractor, Quiet Creek Fence, that I work very closely with. I do a lot of their marketing, website design stuff. And someone was like, I need someone. And I was like, oh, Quiet Creek. Like, who knows? They'll believe me. Like, I just got in this Facebook group, and someone, I have no idea who it was, confirmed, like, yes, Quiet Creek is amazing. And I'm like, yeah, they would believe that because, you know, there's that double verification. That, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. Whoa. So when you're, you know, back to the root of your question was, is how do you know, what if you get somebody who's just giving you the runaround or they're beating around the bush, yeah. right? Well, you'll know as you get better and better with this if you really focus on trust. So if you're building that relationship with somebody, the trust is the thing you're building, okay? Now, one of the quick ways that we do it is through education because people begin to believe in us a little bit more that we don't know or we're not walking in there with a really warm or hot lead. They have no prior knowledge of us. They might have seen us just because they look at the rankings or they, you know, they see our signs out there, whatever. Uh, we'll walk in and 
now I got to build that trust. Well, one of the ways is teach them something. Give them value so they'll believe in you more, okay? And this is why educating and coaching is really important. Like one of the biggest, easiest things we do, I developed this probably about 12 years ago. Every house, I don't care if it's the uh, trailer all, or the Taj Mahal mansion, anything in between. Every house is very much like the human body. It has six majors. Majors? What is that? Okay. Yeah. Six majors. Three are structural and three are mechanical. Okay. So structurally speaking, as humans, we have a head. House has a roof. Okay. We have a torso. House has the center of the house where all the guts live. We have legs or feet. House has a basement or foundation. Mm. So what are the three mechanical? Good question. <laughs> a house has a plumbing system, mm -hmm. and we have a digestive system. House has an electrical system, and we have a nervous system. And a house has a heating, sometimes cooling system to help regulate its temperature. And we have a breathing system, a respiratory system, to help regulate the temperature of our bodies. So these are the six majors that any home inspector is going to start with in breaking the house down when they go to evaluate the home. Or a very seasoned, well-educated buyer coming to buy a home for a seller. Or when we're representing our buyers and we bring them in, we're looking at the six majors. We're evaluating that for them. So we teach that to all of our clients. And right away, that gives us some credibility. It gives them some value across the table. And then we start asking them questions. Now, we've had to go on all of those six majors and drill down on those so that we're a little bit educated. We're not licensed home inspectors, but we know the difference between a three-tab shingle roof and an architectural shingle roof and know the importance and the reason why a roof needs to breathe from underneath, how it needs to be properly insulated, how the soffits need to be on a roof, all the different types of venting on a roof. Um, so we studied roofs, so we know what we're talking about a little bit. And we don't come out at a place like we're inspecting your house from a home inspector you know, concept, but I can talk with the best of them, and I used to be so afraid of anything on a house. Like, I'm not yeah, I'm getting fire hard. hosed right now. I'm like, whoa, I would not even have thought about, like, you said three-tap roof. I'm like, whatever that is. I mean, I'm going to figure it out. But, like, yeah. you, you are bringing extreme value because I feel like the n most average person, like, doesn't know what you're talking about. And as soon as you start saying that, you're like, oh, well, I have to trust John because clearly he knows what I'm, he's talking about. Thank you. So now, <laughs> so now, and you'll know whether or not you're gaining trust. There are certain mm -hmm. questions you can ask, okay, um, in, in, the, in the dialogue um, as things go more and more. Now, I have clients, I, it, goes, it goes overboard the other way because what you don't want to do in this business is have somebody trust you so much that they just say, okay, listen, you just make all the decisions. I'm hiring you. I don't want to know about it. Just get it done. Yeah. And I have that, and I'm like, no, that's not the way it works. I cannot legally make these decisions for you. You have to be smart enough to make them on your own. Now, if you're making a wrong decision, I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. But if you disagree, duty. yeah, as a fiduciary <laughs> duty, I'm going to tell you. But, and I say this tongue-in-cheek to them often that, you know, listen, I have to give you obedience as part of the fiduciary, the old car, that's the O, mm -hmm. obedience. Uh, so if you disagree with me, I have to agree with whatever you finally decide, and you're free to disagree with me. It's America. You're free to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. So if I say that and they laugh, I already know that the trust level has relaxed them enough, even if they're not really a humorous person. They're going to get it. Um, if they don't, I, that tells me I don't have enough trust built with this person. So what do you do then? I slow down. Okay. And I listen more. Mm. But listening more, like, would you say this is like almost like more like, like weeks process or conversation process? Like, are you backing away to give people more time to think? Or are you just like having a conversation, letting them speak again and listen better? Or what is that like? It's on the spot. It's not, not weeks long even though the transaction process and relationship is. Um, but when you're on the spot, you really have to be listening, not just to their words, but their body language. Uh, you can study body language, and we know that you know, 80 90% of communication is nonverbal. 
And so you can really start to understand that if, if you study it a little bit and you discipline yourself to watch it, you can really learn a lot. And you don't want to put everything in a box and start over-presuming, but you do want to be safe and pull back a little bit. Give them more time to think. Sometimes people are slow processors. They don't, might not process as fast as you. Um, but just slowing down a little bit more, um, maybe repeating some things, maybe asking a couple more questions. Um, and questions are like, they're huge. So early in the business, I would ask more questions because it takes me a shorter amount of time to get to that place of building trust than it did back then. And so I'd have to ask more questions, okay? Um, you know, how do you feel about the value of the house? How do you feel, uh, how important is staging to you? How important is it, you know, when it comes to moving day, are you going to want to close on the same day you have to move? Um, do you have other people in your life you're going to want to be a part of the decision, which is absolutely understandable. Mm. And just being quiet after these questions. There's a ton of questions you can come up with. But giving them an opportunity to have a part in it, right? It's their transaction, not yours. You're leading them. That's all. Wow. Makes like sense? It makes so much sense. I'm like, catch me like studying this video as soon as it's done and edited. I'm like, okay, process everything <laughs> and understand. But no, that's so like intelligent and so insightful. And like, so you probably started as like a buyer's agent and now you have a whole team. But so why is sellers like being a seller's agent? Is it almost like, well, you know, these people want to sell their house and you like, why, why do you choose to do that now versus for a buyer client? So the more experience someone comes in the business, the, the terminology becomes really important. Um, we have clients who don't understand the difference between an assessment and an appraisal, as an example. They'll just use that A word, and they think an assessment is an appraisal, and it's confusing. So what's the difference? Please tell. Um, so an assessment is something that the town does so that they understand how to tax your home. Okay. Okay? An appraisal is something that's done, that's done by a third party uh, that tells you what the market value of your home is. Okay, for multiple different reasons. But most of the time in our business, it's because of a bank wants to know how much the, the, the buyer's asking to borrow this much money. They might qualify for it, but the collateral, if they go belly up on that loan, is the value of the house. So they want to know if the value of the house is going to pay them back the money they lent this person when they didn't pay their loan. That's called okay. a foreclosure. They'll foreclose on the house and they'll take the house, and that's how the bank gets their money back, right? And so that's called a foreclosure. Well, they have to send out an appraiser, and that's an appraiser produces an appraisal. That's not an assessment for taxes. They're two totally complete different things. Um, so um, the, the, there's a lot of terminology that's important. So you brought something up, though, that I wanted to touch on, which is in the business, um, we think of two sides of real estate. You, know, you have the buy side and the list side. You refer to it as the sell side. Yeah. Okay. Blech. We think it's the sell side. It's not. Actually, I don't sell any houses. My buyer's agent sells all of them. Okay. I list and market them. Okay. You're the market dominator. The right. marketing. <laughs> so I list them. I don't sell them. And when I list a house, in today's world, we have buyer's agents, and the buyer's agent sells the house. They're bringing the buyer and selling the house to that buyer. I bring it to the market. So I'm not really a selling anything. I'm not a selling agent. The selling agent, technically speaking, is the buyer's agent. So that's why the terminology we use is a list agent, listing agent, and a buyer's agent or a selling agent. Mm, heard, understood. Okay. Okay. And early, a lot of realtors who are new in the business will, re will think that the selling agent is the listing agent. The selling agent is actually the buyer's agent. Okay. They're the, they're the ones selling it. So um, the way that I started out actually doing both right out of the box. Um, one of my first leads was a buyer, but before I found them a house and got them under contract, I picked up a listing and listed a house first, which is rare. I was going to say, that's like not really atypical, is it? No, uh, that's, that's not common today. Uh, so the best way to learn the business 
is though to get in as a buyer's agent because a listing agent is a little bit more complicated. There's a little bit, you know, when you're selling a house, listing a house for somebody, there's a little bit more experience um, and that that client is a little bit more experienced too because now they've, they've already owned gone through the, the process. House. Okay. And All so right. it, it's a little bit of a different experience. But the skill set is really two different, two different things. So my, my buyer's agent, Scott, has a completely different personality than me. How I, do you think he differs from you? Oh, he's much more easygoing. He, you know, if I'm running an open house, I'm like, listen, you don't want to give me your name and address? See you later. You're not, <laughs> you're not getting in the house. <laughs> Is that like a security thing or a legit thing? Like keep it open for the people that are serious or Well, what? technically, yeah, it is a security thing, and that's what I use it for. But it's, no, I control this. You're not going to come in and ruin my open house and say negative things in front of other people. And if you're not willing to give me your name and sign in on the signing sheet, then you're not being obedient to my rules that I set up. Do people do that? Like do they intentionally go in and try to like oh, yeah. skew with it or oh, what? Oh, yeah, maybe a neighbor who doesn't want... Uh, certain people to buy the house, uh, maybe it, or doesn't want those people to move. Um, it could be uh, the sellers are going through a divorce, and so one of the spouses might send some of their friends in to say negative things. The drama. Oh yeah. Have yeah. you have you like had oh, like absolutely. crazy? Oh <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I I yeah. But listen, I I don't tolerate that stuff yeah. at my open house. So Scott. He does. He's totally different. He's, yeah, come on in. Do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, I'm, party. Like, oh. I'm like, God bless you, brother. You're gonna do all my open houses because uh, I'm done. I'm, uh, if I never have to do an open house again, and I probably won't ever, um, then I'm happy. Now he loves doing them. Yeah. You know, he'll be doing one on Saturday. It's like, you know, it. It's it's different strokes for different folks, right? Um, He's definitely more of an otter type person, a social butterfly. Um, me, I'm a little bit more like a lion, you know. I'm a little bit more focused and, um, you know, goal oriented, driven that way. Um, focused on the task, and he's focused on having a conversation with somebody. Um, so, in in the real estate world, it works much better on the buying side to have more of a social butterfly person and then on the listing side you need somebody that's a little bit more focused so our team is a great match the lord really blessed us uh, yeah amen oh my gosh like so like so so when i went to real estate school with tom like kept saying oh my gosh like get a team the first thing you do is get a team get a team get a team and when I had met my first connection at Metro Roberts, I was kind of just asking her questions why she liked the brokerage. And I'm like, oh, are you on a team? And she was like, no. And I love that I'm not on a team. Like, I don't want to be on a team. Like, that's what I value. And then when I came in contact with you, you're, well, how I first even heard of your name was, oh, this is a Christian team. So, like, what was that like creating a team for you? What do you value in that? And, like, what was that like just building that and curating that? So Keller Williams is the uh – they're they're the the pioneers in the real estate business of inventing what is known as the real estate team, mm. and they they were ranked as the country's number one training and coaching business in all businesses, even outside of oh, real wow. estate. And so their whole model was to teach you how to become. Gary Keller wrote a book, a very famous book. It's known as the Red Book, or the mil millionaire real estate agent, okay? okay. Writing that down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, MREA book. It's a book you want to read. And the first half is, you know, very inspirational. The second half deals with business models in real estate, how to build your business. And at some point, you're going to cap out if you're your own agent. Um, you can only do so many things in a day, right? Right. And so... At the end of the day, if you're going to grow, continue to grow your business, then you have to hire other people. You have to grow your team, okay? Um, and it is very highly recommended that the first thing you do is you hire an administrator first. And then once you've got it down and you're doing both listings and uh, buy sides and you have, you're growing to a point where you can't do anymore, you get administrative help to help you do the administration, the paperwork, and then you build up again until you get to a limit. And then you hire a buyer's agent, and you keep listing, and that buyer's agent then comes on. 
and you grow your team that way. And that's the most successful, proven the most successful way to build a team. So people that are getting into the business and they're telling you, you got to build a team, you got to build a team, you're not, they're, they're not giving sound advice. Okay, they're just not. They, they don't know what they're talking about. And those aren't people that have been in the business for 10 years and are already running a successful team generally. Okay, these are people who maybe b might be uh, managers working in an office. They've never done it. <laughs> they don't know. Um, you know, just different people talking. But when it comes down to it, uh, I got on a team originally at Keller Williams and we went into a 50-50 partnership. And so that was not a good model. And I learned the hard way. And so I got out of that. 50-50 with, like, the leader of the team of the bro. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, so I, I had another agent who, uh, he's kind of like the bull in a china shop. Um, workhorse, though, a workhorse. Uh, did a lot of business, generated business. Um, and we went in 50-50. And the problem was it wasn't set up the way the model says you're supposed to set it up. And so we weren't really evenly yoked either, mm -hmm. okay? And so there was some conflict that, that began to happen. And so we ended up splitting up, which was a wise thing. I'm still friends with them today. Mo many, many people in the business know who I'm talking about, you know. But yeah, um, I, I love the guy. Uh, it, it, but it wasn't a good fit, so we, we moved on. And I wasn't going to, you know, have any other partners or build a team. I, di I didn't want to. And then when COVID hit, um, I, I got Scott into the business. He was my former client. That's your business partner? Like your team partner? Yeah, my, my, my buyer's agent, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I, the Market Dominators team is my team. Uh, I own the team. I own the brand. And Scott um, is a buyer's agent on my team. And, but because of the way we, we, we roll – you know, we're known as the market dominators, and I have a lot of trust in Scott. He's, he's, you know, I tease him. He's young enough to be my son. He's, I kind of look at him like a son, but he's, but he's very mature, and he's, um, he's very skilled. He's self-directed, and I trust him. And because of that, we brand ourselves together. So a lot of people think it's, you know, it's both of us, but that's okay. I don't. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and so now. We, we like it the way it is. We control what we do. Um, we don't want others. I'll never end up being unevenly yoked again, and that, that's, that's a big reason. So Scott loves the Lord. He's uh, very committed at his church, at Lovejoy Church. Um, he's a talented drummer. He's on their worship band, um, and he does a lot. He's committed to, to the church, and he does a lot for, for his community and his family, and um, you know, we you know we we we'll pray together. We'll we pray over our clients, um, all of our clients. We pray for and um, we want them to be affected and have a, a phenomenal experience. You know, um, so a team can be beneficial from a business perspective, but for people who are getting into the business, you want to keep it simple. Remember, you're drinking out of a fire hose, so. <laughs> you you don't want to get so overwhelmed that you do nothing well and you learn nothing good, right? So you want to you wanna be able to learn in a good way that you memorize it and you develop it and you, you, you in a disciplined fashion, you, uh, you work that into who you are. You know, and I worked in, I, I went on home inspections when I first got in the business and I, this, somebody told me, this guy, home inspector's awesome. This is who I use. I connected with him right away. I went to every home inspection. If I didn't have anything to do that day, I'd call him up and I'd say, Dan, do you have any inspections today? He says, yeah, I got two, two more today. I said, great, where are they at? I want to come. wasn't even my house. I would go and I would sit there and I'd tell me, show me, tell me about this house. Don't stop talking. I'm going to be right on your shoulder. That's what I'd say to him. Literally, he taught me. And I realized, I'm listening to him, how he's breaking that house down. He's breaking it up into parts. I'm like, wait a minute. He had five parts. I'm like, actually, I think there's six. It's kind of like the body, the human body. I came up with the six majors. And I started branding that, and I developed a script out of it, which I gave earlier a little bit. 
It was a very well written script, and yeah. it sounds like you say it a lot in the best way. <laughs> yeah, and so Scott does this, I do it, and this is what we do. We teach people the six majors of a house in a very short script, and when Scott takes somebody in a consultation, and he says it to him in a Tim Hortons, the first house that they go see, he gets out of the car and he stops him in the driveway and he says, "Now, no, before we go any further, I just want to remind you." And he puts his hands up, and it's it's body language and it's verbal language. There's six majors to this house. Three are structural and three are mechanical. So let's do a quick review. Structurally speaking, we have our head, torso, and legs. House has the roof, the center of the house, and the basement and the foundation. Three mechanicals. You have a nervous system. House has electrical. You have a digestive system. House has plumbing. You have a breathing system. House has heating and cooling. This is what we're going to be focused on first. So it's going to be important. You stick with me. And a lot of times you might be talking to a couple and the, wo the woman's going to want to go to the kitchen and the husband's want to go to the garage in the basement. <laughs> So you can't have that happen when you're showing a house. You have yeah. to have a reason to tell them to stick with you. You're going to stick with me because if you're something poor on one of these majors, you're going to want to know about it. And if there's something really good about these majors, you're also going to want to know that because if you fall in love with this house and you want to put an offer in, you're going to want to know where the value is. So when I tell you you're going to have to pay $20,000 over list price, you're going to want to know why. Okay? Now, it's important for us to stick together too because I'm going to be observing you. I don't know what makes you tick or ticked in a house. I'm going to see how you're going to experience the house and learn a little bit about what you like and what you don't like. You might like the layout. You might not like the colors. You might, the decorating, the staging, the whatever. I need to learn. And I'm going to learn through experience instead of sitting down here and filling out, having you fill out a questionnaire. I'll learn it as we go. Osmosis in our relationship. Does that make sense? No, it does. So can we stick together when we go through here? Yeah. Great. Let's go see this house. <laughs> okay. This is outside. You're like, okay, you're giving them the six majors. You're telling them to stick with this. And then like, what's like the first thing you do as soon as you walk into the house? What are you showing them? So we, we don't walk into the house first. We do the walk around on the outside. Okay. So we're going to then do some education on the roof. Mm. We're going to look at the siding and the windows, the basement of the foundation, the lower part, the base of the foundation. We're going to look and see how water flows away from the house, what the gutters are like. Water is the most powerful thing on the planet, so you want to know, understand how the house handles water. How do you know that if it's just dry outside? You're just, like, looking to see if, like, well, the land is, like, going in yeah. and the gutters are falling down or what? Like Water always leaves a sign. You can't hide it. Uh, <laughs> if I was the water, I would be scared of you, John. <laughs> you should be. Uh, you should. If you learn, it's very easy, though, to learn uh, the path of water that it takes, it always leaves a trail. Mm. It always leaves a, a mess behind. It always stains something. It will, it, it, it will carve out the earth and create a grand canyon. That's what the Colorado River's done. I mean, it's powerful, water is powerful. So if the grade is coming back into the house, I don't care how good the gutters are, at some point that was from water. And the water is going to come in, and there's going to be a problem. So I'll look at it, and I'll know, I'll note it in my head. When we get into the basement on this side of the house, i got to see how the inside of the basement is handling that. Okay? So, Understood. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot, and you can study that. But I went, and I met with my home inspector. You know? I, he taught me a lot, and I put the time in, and I knew where to put it. And... That was helpful for me. So I got ahead, and I knew more than some agents who have been selling houses for 20 years. How do you, like, feel about, like, in a, a market, like, now, like, where, like, like, okay, my uncle just sold his house, like, right when I was getting my, like, license, like, take my test, and, like, he had three cash offers. No one wanted a home inspection because, like, the market is just so evaporated. Everyone wants the house. Like, do you, and not that you're actually that and legally not that, like, do you feel like you have to be part home inspector? What are you advising, advising people to do with inspections? Like so when you bring a house to market, you don't know whether or not you're going to get three offers with waived home inspections. Mm -hmm. You might get a better offer that has a home inspection, but if you understand what is involved and you know the house, then you might not have any worries if it's a really good house. So take an offer that's 20 grand higher that has a home inspection. The home inspection is not going to get in the way of this house. This house is all buttoned up. Six majors are great. You have another house that's very concerning. Listen, that home inspection, that waived home inspection might have a ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 value. Wow. To it. Wow. Okay. And so you got you to gotta know the difference. But 
Also, it's important because you have a lot of sellers who are not educated and they haven't sold a house in this market before and now they want to bring a house to the market. I have one I'm going to be going to see shortly. They want to do everything on the house to update the house before to take it to market. And I'm like, no, you're not in that market now. You don't have to do that. Don't waste your money on that. Because people are just going to buy it anyway. Yeah. It, you don't have to. It's it, They're going to buy it anyway. And they're not going to walk away from the house because of these things. So there's no reason for you to do them. If we were in a buyer's market, you got to be more competitive than the next house, you know, the other 40 houses that are on the market that are in your market. Okay? There's markets like that. Now, you don't know that market yet because no. right now, you know, I'd say you have no competition. Don't update that. You have no competition, you know, and I'd save them money and they appreciate it, you know, let the buyer do that. Damn. So. And that's, what, oh, excuse my language, but <laughs> right. you are the market dominator. And that's like, that is just, I could go on for hours and hours and you have to go list house. But yeah. I will say, um, if there's one thing you could tell your younger self or just like as a new agent, what would be the advice you would give them besides going on home inspections, which I've noted. <laughs> uh, I think the most underrated skill in the business, and I have an 86 year old aunt who was a real estate broker when I was a young kid and she did very well. Um, and she told me when I was 18 years old getting into sales, not real estate, but just into sales, um, you, if you want to be successful at this, in any sales business, you better learn how to listen. And I didn't understand that for another 10 years. But listening to your clients, don't verbal vomit on your client. Ask them a question that has a strategy to it and listen because you want information. And then you can use that information to help serve them. Building trust and listening. You won't build trust if you don't listen. So that's my advice. Um, there's a lot of room in the business for a great uh, amount of success. Um, I wish you particularly, but all new agents, uh, you know, put the time in, put the commitment into it, and you get out of it what you put into it, you know. So I love that. Thank you for joining the podcast. And it yeah. was amazing talking to you. So I appreciate your time. Yeah. Where I'll can see. the people find you? Uh, they can find me at 716-570-3298. You can go to the Market Dominators team on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook by my name. Um, listen, I'm about as public as you can be. So if you want to find me, it's J-O-H-N, last name Spazchak, S-P-A-S-C-H-A-K. I just gave you my personal cell phone number, <laughs> and I will answer it, okay? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Google, a a anywhere. Um, I, you know, it, uh, realtors are, should never be hard to find. <laughs> so... Um, I'll, I'll leave you with this, and, and that is a, a great Aramaic word called kortas te sunta. Oh. And that means be filled. That comes out of the uh, 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 Gospel of John. It means be filled with the Spirit, Lauren. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an Aramaic word that Jesus used to speak because they wrote in Greek, but they would speak in Aramaic. So the Aramaic is kortas te sunta.